Once upon a tabletop, some adventurers gather to attend their settlement's first major festival. Hey everyone, I'm Jonathan Rutledge, and this is episode 8 of Colonial Cardia Lark's Landing, a 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons campaign being played at a local board game cafe called The Devil's Bench. When last we left our heroes, they were camping out in the jungle a day away from their settlement. In the morning, they discuss whether they want to head back to the settlement or go out on another expedition. Their decision is made by the realization that tomorrow is the first of waning spring. That means that the settlement will most likely be holding the Spring Festival. This is a major event held in the name of Falma, the goddess of spring, birth, and redemption. She's one of the four seasonal gods that make up the strongest part of the Pantheon. She's also the god worshipped by Gilligan the Human Mystic. So they spend the day traveling home. Before entering their house, Stor the Goblin Monk and Shent the Dwarven Ranger check for traps. They've become quite cautious since finding their own traps returned to them. However, there's nothing there. They awake early in the morning to the sound of music. They head out into the settlement and follow the sound down to the beach where almost everyone is. A large pool is standing upright in the sand, held in place by lots of ropes covered in every flag that could be scavenged from the noble's lark. There are also a few crude booths and tables scattered around. As they reach the celebration, they're mobbed by a group of children who hand each of them three seashells. Stor asks the children what they're for, and they say they're for playing the games. The adventurers head off to have some fun and gorge themselves on the free food that's being provided. At the games, they have some successes and failures, but as a group, they manage to win prizes from every one of them. Acta, the tiefling warlock, wins a stone arrowhead by knocking down three posts with stones. The arrowhead immediately gets everyone's attention, and they ask the children running the games where they got it. The kids say that they found it along the beach along with all the other prizes. Stor wins a pretty rock from a shell game. He gets Gilgan to take a look at it. Gilgan is pretty sure the rock isn't worth anything, but tells Stor that it's a very important rock. Kordak, the half-orc fighter, finds a game very much to his tastes. It involves using a hammer to strike a lever to send a coconut flying down the beach. He hits the lever so hard that not only does the coconut fly farther than any other, but he also breaks the game. Luckily, Gilgan is on hand to fix it. Balasar, the dragonborn cleric, also tries this game with little success. In fact, on his second try, he misses the lever entirely. He tries to convince the child that he should get another swing for free because he didn't even hit the lever, but he doesn't succeed. He grumpily storms off. Gilgan wins a necklace of seashells from a puzzle game. Shen becomes interested in a game with a tub of water that people are submerging their heads in. He finds out that at the bottom of the tub there's sand with objects hidden in it. The aim is to retrieve a specific wooden peg with your teeth. On his first try, Kordak kicks him all the way into the tub. Laughing, he tries again, but with no success. So Kordak gives it a try and comes up with the peg. He wins another pretty stone. Wondering if his stones have any value, he asks Shen to examine them. The first one, Shen realizes, is not natural, it was made by magic. He hands it off to Balzar to determine if it is indeed magical. Balzar casts Detect Magic and realizes that is, and so is the arrowhead that Akta won. With his Identify spell, he determines that this stone is known as a Rhyme Stone, named for the deity of magic and the unknown. This particular one will float around a user's head and prevent them from being surprised. Akta's arrowhead will burst into flame upon striking an enemy. She grudgingly gives it to Shen. Kordak's other stone is a moonstone of some value. The one store one is just a pretty rock, and Gilligan's necklace of seashells is just a necklace of seashells. Balazar gives his last seashell ticket to Acta so she can try out the last game. This involves singing a song while holding a piglet under her arm. The goal is to see who can sing the longest before the pig starts squealing. Acta amazes everyone by singing for almost four minutes before the piglet starts to wail. She wins herself a conch shell. The day fades to night and the celebrations continue. Various spellcasters around send magical fireworks and illusions into the air. Everyone's having a great time, but eventually the activity winds down. At last, the adventurers go home for the night. As everyone's getting ready to go to sleep, Acta asks what everyone did before crossing the Endless Ocean. Kordak says he fought in the military. Gilgan tells a story about being a farmer, which everyone believes. And Stor tells them how he was raised by a sorcerer and a... mercenary who had slaughtered his tribe. They'd found themselves unable to kill the baby goblin, so they'd raised him as their own. Kordak turns the question on Acta, asking what she did before coming across. She expresses that it's time to sleep and rolls over. Not having any of that, Kordak picks her up by the leg, demanding to know what she used to do. She refuses to answer and tells him to let her go, so he drops her on her head and goes back to bed. They all go to sleep, Stor and Gilligan with small stomach aches from overeating. 
In the morning, Stor, Balazar, and Gilgan all decide they have business with Farian the wizard, so they head out over to his tower. They knock on the door and hear something break inside. Stor asks if he was involved in the fireworks the previous night. Farian says he was and was rather proud of the displays. Gilgan asks if his copy of the Identify spell is ready yet. At this, Farian becomes a little shifty, saying that he hasn't been able to get the supplies needed for it yet. He explains that when dealing with magical spells, you need specially prepared paper and ink. Unfortunately, those have been rather hard to come by. They ask him what sorts of materials are needed. He says blood and objects from magical creatures and plants are best. Gilgan, having already paid him for this service, isn't too happy, but Farian insists that he will get it done. Balazar asks Farian if he will accompany him out to the Singing Stone. He thinks that if they put their heads together, they might be able to figure out the strange magical object. Farian expresses a great deal of interest in magical objects and agrees to go along. The four of them head out to the Singing Stone. Meanwhile, Shen heads into Naldor's general store. Akta decides to accompany him. He asks if there's been any interest in the rhino horn he's left behind. There hasn't been yet, so he trades it out for the smaller of the two. Then he asks about some woodcarver's tools, which he might use to make his own arrows. He's tried to attach the magical arrowhead to an arrow, but he doesn't have the skills or tools. He believes these are what he needs. Naldor rummages through his pile of tools and produces a set. He agrees to trade the smaller horn for the tools. As Shend and Acta leave, the tiefling calls over his shoulder, Bye, racist guy! Naldor spits at her, so she spits back. They begin searching around the settlement for someone who might be able to carve the rhino horn into a piece of jewelry for Shen. As they walk, Shen tells Acta about how he's set out to make his people proud. During this, Kordak has gone to speak with Hargrom, his second in command of the militia. He asks if they have anyone in the militia with the skills for building a ballista. Hargrom says they do, but they're currently focusing their attention on building the town hall. Kordak suggests splitting the energy between the two projects. He wants the ballista to be prepared in case the giant reptile attacks the settlement. When Kordak is about to leave, Hargrom stops him. He asks if he's sure about that Gorbosh character. Kordak assures him that he trusts the half-orc, saying that he's been helping them since on the ship. Hargrom hesitates before saying more, but decides he has to get this off his chest. He tells the tale of how, when fleeing the Empire, he came across the caravan that Kordak's family were supposed to be in. It had been destroyed and burned. There had been a half-orc at the ruins, and Hargrom had attacked. He didn't manage to slay the half-orc, but he did manage to chop off one of his tusk-like teeth. He couldn't be certain that Gormbosh was this half-orc, but he was pretty sure. Kordak falls silent. He asks if Gormbosh found the bodies of his family, but the dwarf said he didn't have time to look around very long. Kordak knows from a conversation Stor had with Gormbosh that the half-orc used to be part of the Samvidian army. Back then, he and the group had decided that it didn't matter. This was a new world and a new life for everyone. Now he's not so certain. Angry and confused, he grabs an axe and heads out to the tree line to chop wood. Out at the Singing Stone, Varian asks what experiments have been done with this fascinating magical object. Balzar, Gilgan, and Stor list off everything they can think of. Varian suggests that perhaps a magical tool or weapon would be able to chip off a sample that Balzar wants. Other than that, he can't think of anything right now. He heads back to the village. Stor, wanting to ask Shend a question, accompanies him. Balzar and Gilgan remain behind to experiment with the stone. When he gets back to the settlement, Stor can't find Shend. So, getting another idea, he heads to the general store. He asks for brewing supplies. Naldor does have some, but they're broken. Stor knows that Gilgan can repair broken items, so he decides to trade for it. He offers up his hunting trap in exchange. Naldor is hesitant to make the trade, but he agrees, knowing that broken brewing equipment is useless to him anyway. Stor takes his new equipment back to the stone to be repaired by Gilgan. Shend and Acta, unable to find someone to carve the rhino horn, decide to find Kordak. He's easy to locate. As they approach, they can tell he's in a foul mood. They attempt to talk to him, asking what's wrong, but get no response. Around this time, Gilgan has flown up to the top of the Singing Stone, for the second time, having fallen down on the first occasion. He's able to see clouds massing off in the distance. Hearing this, Balzar decides to head back to the settlement. Stor is just arriving back with his equipment to be repaired by Gilgan. The mystic is happy to oblige. Suddenly, they're hit by a tropical downpour. They hurry after Balasar to get home. As the storm hits the settlement, Shend and Acta head home as well. However, before they get there, the storm passes and the sun comes out again. They decide to head back to Kordak. They all eventually regroup around their half-orc friend who is ferociously chopping at trees. Shen decides to try and cheer him up by jumping on his back. Kordak swings a punch at him, but misses. Not really catching the hint, Acta tries jumping on his back. Kordak's punch sends her flying. Shend apologizes, saying that he only meant to cheer him up. He asks what's wrong. 
Kordak grumbles about it being about family. Shend offers to help, but Kordak says he doesn't know what needs to be done yet. Seeing his roiling emotion suggests they go out into the jungle and kill something. Kordak agrees that this seems like a good idea, and so the group head out into the jungle, making lots of noise and searching for tracks. They happen upon the tracks of what look like four large feline creatures. After a while, Shend and Stor warn the others that they believe they have become the hunted. Shend notices something up on a tree branch and shoots at it. He misses, but he's revealed its presence to the rest of the group. They have more luck hitting the branch, but it brings the creature into view. It's a tiger, and it leaps down to attack. Another tiger and two saber-toothed tigers come out of the brush to attack as well. The adventurers fight back as hard as they can. After a brief flurry of action, Balazar goes down unconscious. The others renew their ferocious attacks. Balazar remarkably regains consciousness, and they finish off the tigers. However, many of them are heavily wounded. And Gilgan, having used up all of his psionic power, has become a blithering idiot. And that's where this week's session draws to a close. As always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and leave a comment down below letting me know what you think. If you want to support the channel, there's a link for that down in the description, as well as a link to my website where you can buy the chainmail that I make. And that's all for today. Check back in a week to find out what happens next, once upon a tabletop.